Seasonic, the heart of your system. I'm Leo Wood for Kit Guru. This is Leo Says, the Intel edition, following on from my uh, Leo Says, the AMD edition. I've been to Israel. I've been to Fab 28 at Kiryat Gat. Uh, which is a 10 nanometer fab and I got given this free book which was actually the kind of explanation for why we had the trip in the first place Startup Nation the story of Israel's economic miracle uh, because we spent a day about this is about 18 European journos give or take I, I counted a few times I got different numbers each time I'm saying 18 uh, we went to IDC which is the Israel Development Center which is at Haifa which is north of Tel Aviv about an hour north and then the second day we spent the morning at Kiryat Gat which is south of Tel Aviv. My question here is what on earth was Intel's motive for taking us there? I'm very nice of them to take us. The cynic in me and other people was saying well if these people are here they're not at home testing their AMD Zen 2 hardware they're not getting those reviews ready so in a sense by having people in Israel we're sort of slightly disrupting the uh, launch of Zen 2 and the public position as stated by Intel and this seems entirely plausible is that Intel has a lot of very clever engineers who want to talk about the good stuff they're doing and Israel's the perfect place to do it uh, that's why they took us there so IDC the Israel Development Center this is where an awful lot of processors are designed but particularly the core stuff and if you go back all the way to Centrino and before, that all came out of Israel. And then the fabrication plant in Kiryat Gat is where an awful lot of processors are made. Uh, at the moment, Kiryat Gat is both 14 nanometer and 10 nanometer. Uh, there's also 10 nanometer done over in uh, Oregon, uh, Intel's fab there. So uh, processors are designed at IDC. They send what they've got over to Oregon, who then uh, work, uh, validate the processor design for one thing, and then start doing some initial production on whatever the process is they're going to use to produce those processors. And once they're happy, they send it back to Kiryat Gat to actually manufacture it properly. Now, we know full well that 10 nanometer has been... And I'm going to do my best to be positive throughout this, Leo says, because knocking Intel is getting a little bit boring for me personally. And I think I can make it through, but I'm still going to say it. 10 nanometer has been fairly bad news, disastrous potentially. The thing is, up to now, Intel has locked the microarchitecture and the fabrication process together. So Ice Lake, which is the resulting processor, which is a quad core mobile part with uh, Gen 11 graphics, is Sunny Cove microarchitecture and 10 nanometer process, and it results in Ice Lake. And you might ask yourself, well, if 10 nanometers a catastrophe or hit problems or whatever, why don't they make uh, Ice Lake on 14 nanometer plus plus instead? After all, it'll still be done at uh, Kiryat Gat Fab 28. But not the way, because the design is locked down to being 10 nanometer. The two things go hand in hand. So all those code names come out as Ice Lake and there's a problem. And essentially the delay has been a year. And I think a, de a year if we're being charitable, because you could easily argue it's 18 months. So before I go on about the uh, fab tour, I'm going to be doing uh, a page on Kit Guru about the trip because at IDC they talked to us about a lot of things and some of it was very interesting and some of it was frankly less interesting. They kind of bolted some talks on the end that were of almost no relevance to me personally. Uh, so stuff to do with encryption, not my field. They were talking about Ethernet uh, because they've got 100 gigabit, would you believe, Ethernet cards, albeit they're quite serious bits of kit, which are to do with server things. And the demo there basically was saying that if you have a 100 megabit connection um, at home, which after all many of us do if you've got decent internet, that means it can now support 1000 uh, full on connections. You think, well, I can do that maths, I understand this. So the fact that they got fast Ethernet, the previous fastest was 40 gigabit is like, well, OK. But that to me is a line of news and a photo. Ice Lake, lots of good stuff that they were talking about, but there were some massive obvious holes in what they were talking about. Roadmaps primarily. So we've got the 9 watt, 15 watt, 28 watt parts, 45 watt not mentioned, desktop parts not mentioned, what's going on on the server side not mentioned, just gulfs in the conversation they were very much sticking to what they wanted to talk about but when it came down to the actual nuts and the bolts the processors going into you know the laptops i'm going to be using in the future as i say they skipped over stuff on the other hand we had guys talk about things like thunderbolt 3 which is now being rolled into usb 4 stuff like that is at a fairly fine level interesting stuff there i hope to try and convey some of that and get it on the page for you 
So we were told about Sunny Cove, but Sunny Cove we had already heard about. I mean, I hadn't heard about it directly because Intel held an architecture day in California a couple of weeks before Computex, and a bunch of journals went over for that. Uh, so we've seen most of the decks about Ice Lake and Sunny Cove. Uh, Sunny Cove being the microarchitecture and Ice Lake being the resulting processor on 10 nanometer. That we knew about, uh, and then you take the bits and pieces that Intel clearly was not going to talk about, even though you assume the guys in that room knew exactly uh, what was going on, and uh, we were left with questions. And then the following day we went off to Kiriak Gat to Fab 28, and there's a photo of us all looking absolutely ridiculous in the bunny suits that people wear in clean rooms. And I'm going to say it here and I'm going to say it now, we don't actually get to go in the clean room. Uh, we were in a visitor center and you can take photos in the visitor center. There's very little to show in the visitor center. There are some very old bits and pieces, old processors and old wafers and such like. There's a rack of bunny suits at the back. You clamber into the bunny suit, they take a couple of photos and then you take the kit off because when you do a tour of the fab, you're looking through windows. It is called a window tour. You don't get to go in the clean room. But nonetheless, it was interesting. And it was interesting because this is the very first time any media have been to Kiriak Gat to Fab 28. And talking among the journals who are there, and every single person there is, has been in the industry for a good few years. The, the most recent fab tour that Intel has done, as far as we can recall, was back in 2005. Uh, it's been a lifetime. Now, you could possibly think that the reason Intel's doing a fab tour now, particularly at a, a fab that does 10 nanometer, is because they're desperate for good PR, and that's possible. It could be they just want to beat their chest and say, we've got all this good stuff coming at the end of the year, realistically, but Q3, Q4. Uh, it could be that. Uh, it might be that this is the crown jewels. This is something they can do because as Intel used to say, real men have fabs. Now we know that uh, Nvidia and AMD are both fabless, uh, as indeed is Apple, I think. Yeah, Apple's fabless. So uh, when Intel says real men have fabs, that basically means Intel and Samsung because they have fabs at the cutting edge, except of course Intel's had problems at the cutting edge with 10 nanometer. So the tour was interesting, even though you don't get to see very much through the windows and you cannot take photos and you cannot do video. When we're walking back and we're away from the do not take photos area, we're walking along a great big corridor, just a load of doors left and right, heading back to the visitor center. And I stopped and used my phone to take a picture of a door which said Intel 3D Printing Lab, because I thought it looked interesting. The door was closed, you could see nothing, it's just a door. No names, no nothing. And the security guy who was uh, assigned to us uh, said, no, you're going to have to delete that photo. And he watched while I did as well. So I'm, I'd like to say a level of paranoia, caution. There was a level of caution being exhibited. So the idea we're going to take photos through the windows into the clean room, that's not happening. So we've got some stock shots supplied by Intel. I don't know where they were taken. I don't know when they were taken, but they are of a fab. And... The curious thing is, as was explained to us, and this is why it's handy being there, because I've seen the, you know, the, the robots whizzing boxes around on tracks and so on and dropping them into tools and doing magical stuff. But you don't know what's going on. And having seen it through windows, I don't know what was going on. I know what I was told, but I don't know what was going on. Because that fab uh, Kiriak Gat is both 14 nanometer and 10 nanometer. And the two production lines share certain tools. So when you see a thing whizzing towards you and dropping down into place, I don't know if it had anything. It had, did it have a wafer inside? No idea. Was that the 40 nanometer line or the 10 nanometer line? Not a clue. What was it doing? Not a clue. No idea at all. It, it's obviously a bit more than just a PR show because there's an awful lot of stuff. I mean, it's a huge space. The facility is just enormous. The money involved is astronomical. They have recently, Intel spent 5 billion US dollars at Kiriak Gat. Uh, basically expanding the site internally. They said they had repurposed a previous canteen and another space. They basically added them to the fab. Five billion. They were due to spend another 11 billion this year uh, uh, adding a new um, uh, facility there on the same sort of grounds. And we assume that was building a seven nanometer fab, we assume, uh, and presumably seven nanometer EUV. But that has been delayed by a year. Now we know 10 nanometer is running at least a year behind schedule. So the idea that they're holding off on the next building makes sense because everything's shifted back by a year, a year or more. Uh, one of the changes that's come out of the 
frankly failure of 10 nanometer is that whereas up to now the microarchitecture and the fabrication process have been locked together they're moving to a much more sensible system where they use the best architecture and the best fabrication process at any one time they put the two together and they say there you go and if that was the case you'd expect that uh, ice lake would have been manufactured on uh, 14 nanometer using sunny cove uh, microarchitecture uh, while I think about it, one thing that I didn't hear mentioned at all at IDC or indeed the fab was uh, Fovros, the packaging, uh, which I think was mentioned at the Architecture Day. Fovros didn't hear it mentioned whatsoever. I did ask the fab manager, who's a very technical chap. I mean, he's not just a manager, he's clearly a technician who's managing the place. I asked him uh, about 10 nanometer delays basically was the only thing he could say and he essentially just said it's a 2.7 times higher transistor density than previously and that has caused problems and that's all he said uh, we've heard that cobalt is part of the problem uh, apparently they're changing a couple of the layers that have previously been copper to cobalt and there have been suggestions that's one of about four different problems that have come together and caused delays and he just said no that's that's not the problem it's the transistor density and that was all he was saying. Whether that's correct or not, I have not got a clue, but that's what I was told directly. I mean, this is told in front of the group. And even that tiny level of information is more than you usually get from the PR and marketing people. But nonetheless, it's not, not satisfactory to know so little. The big question is, why on earth has 10 nanometer been delayed so badly? Uh, the knock-ons are what impact does it have on roadmaps and frankly it'd be nice to ask why is Ice Lake so slow? It's a quad-core processor that just appears to run really, really slow. Now if you look back at Intel's uh, roadmap of technologies from, it was 2017, so more than a year ago now they showed on that roadmap and this is judging intel by intel's own uh, standards that 10 nanometer was going to be slower than 40 nanometer plus plus 10 nanometer plus which was due this year because 10 nanometer was due last year so 10 nanometer plus was due this year that was going to be slightly slower than 40 nanometer plus plus 10 nanometer plus plus which was due next year but clearly is not going to happen next year now so 2021 at this rate that is expected to be faster than 40 nanometer plus plus wow now in and of itself clock speeds are not the key metric even though i know that sounds like heresy they're not what counts is the performance which is a, a basket of ipc and clock speeds and latency and all sorts and we tend to look at it in terms of core count and turbo speeds and such like but at a certain level if a given processor is faster than that processor doing games and waking up and internet shopping and email and whatever and if it turns out that this faster processor is actually running at three and a half gigahertz and that one's running at four and a half gigahertz then the fact this is doing it at a slower clock speed in and of itself is fine the problem is and this is my current issue with ice lake among other things is if ice lake is three and a half gigahertz then what i want to know is what would happen if it was four and a half gigahertz would it be even more better that at the moment is a question we're just simply not going to have answered. What we need at the moment is to actually see Ice Lake after the debacle that was Cannon Lake. One of the areas of uh, pride actually from the Intel engineers was the graphics in Ice Lake which are Gen 11 and that's because Gen 9's the previous, Gen 10 was the graphics that were meant to be in Cannon Lake, Cannon Lake just didn't happen so Gen 10 dead, Gen 11 double Gen 9 gen 12 double gen 11 double in this instance appears in the first case to mean double the execution units or more execution units running faster equals double now when you're starting from a base of frankly not very much which is where intel has been with graphics doubling is impressive but it's mm, how interesting is it does it mean you can now game at 1080 rather than 720 if for example it means that that's really good if it means you can bump up image quality from medium to high, and I'm not saying you can, I would say it means you can bump image quality to medium in most instances, then that's the thing. The leap from uh, 720 to 1080 to 1440 to 4K, as you know, gaming at 4K, for example, requires some very serious graphics. Gaming at 1440 high frame rate requires really serious graphics. 1080 high frame rates, 
that's still not to be sneezed at. And Intel graphics have been a very long way off that mark. So Intel is really cock a hoop about the integrated graphics in particularly Ice Lake and what's coming next. At which point I say, well, okay, let's wait and see because you know, what else can I say? But they're basically being very positive. And this is curious really when you consider that 10 nanometer has just been so you know appalling. But then the IDC people are saying that the, what they've designed and what the potential they have uh, in the future is huge. And what they've done in the past actually is also huge. And um, essentially what they weren't quite saying is, sure there's this bit of a snag with 10 nanometer in production, but kind of wait till you see what we've been working on because it's all really good stuff. And you kind of have to feel sorry for the way because the guys an hour north of Tel Aviv, I'm not saying they feel the guys an hour south have let them down, but there's clearly been you know a problem. Their stuff is not being produced there. So where does this leave us? Is Intel having a disastrous year? Is AMD about to have a brilliant year? It really depends on your perspective. I said in the last Leo says that Zen 2 looks like it's gonna rock and roll, and I, I think it will. I remain cautious about how much it's going to rock and roll because I really want to see higher clock speeds from Zen 2. Nonetheless, AMD with its roadmaps was expecting Intel to be at a certain point now and Intel simply is not there. You might in fact argue that Coffee Lake was added to Intel's roadmaps some while ago uh, because of AMD Ryzen, which suddenly meant eight cores on the desktop, when at the time Intel had been, you know, quad cores as good as you got. And we saw the six core 8700K, Core i7 8700K in 2017, Coffee Lake. And then we saw the Coffee Lake refresh in 2018, eight cores i9 9900K. And meanwhile, there have been, you know, sort of problems around the side. So the mobile version of Coffee Lake, Whiskey Lake, uh, is really to do mitigations for Meltdown and Spectre, for example. And you go, oh, that's right, Intel had all this security problems. Didn't they just have problems? Yes, they did. Publicity and PR came out of it very bad for Intel. Did it affect sales? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say it's the sort of thing that got, uh, it was in the news. It gave them news headlines that were negative. Have they had sales knocked? No, they have not. Why is that? Because Intel basically owns the mobile market in terms of laptops. Uh, has AMD got anything to offer as a counter? No, they haven't. AMD may well have mobile Zen 2 parts that do a decent job and they take a chunk of the laptop market. In fact, I hope they do. Really, really hope they do. At the moment, Intel owns the notebook market both in terms of PC, Windows and also Apple and having AMD in there would be a good thing. AMD must see the potential, of course they do. If you think about it, if Intel currently owns about 100% of the market and AMD owns some vanishingly small percentage, AMD could five times or even 10 times their existing market. The potential for increasing it from a starting point of pretty much zero is just enormous. The thing is with mobile, there's more to it than just the processor, more to it than just the chipset. You've got the integrated graphics, clearly AMD can do that. You've got battery power, you've got Wi-Fi, you've got all sorts. Things like integrated Thunderbolt now, previously USB. All the gubbins has to be integrated. Intel can do that, can AMD? Probably the answer is yes, uh, using add-in controllers from here, there and everywhere. As to whether it's such a slick package being offered to uh, HP and Dell and and so on and so forth, that remains to be seen. Right now, Intel owns the market. Intel uh, doesn't want to lose any of that market for sure. Hopefully, AMD is going to take some of the laptop market off them. Ice Lake is due sooner rather than later, and that is clearly intended to make sure that if Zen 2 does sneak into the laptop market, Intel gets it back just as swiftly as possible. We've got chips to do with uh, AI. Uh, we were shown an Ice Lake chip on an M.2 package, I'll put that on the page, that uh, is used for inference. Uh, when you have hardware for training AI systems, that's whacking great big graphics cards with massive amounts of memory, massive parallel processing. When you come to inference, which is the way you have uh, the silicon in, for example, up a wind turbine or in a self-driving car or wherever, that hardware is a completely different thing and the market there must be for billions of units potentially. So 
the fact we've actually seen a guy holding an M.2 device, which was an isolated processor saying this is used in AI, was a real surprise. And as a partner, it has a web page. I mean, it exists. I just wasn't particularly aware of it. So seeing that in the guy's hand, that was interesting. But getting on to the big tin, Epic Rome was originally designed to compete with uh, Ice Lake Xeon. And Ice Lake Xeon is not a thing at the moment. Uh, we've only just seen the release of Cascade Lake, I think two months ago from memory. Uh, we've had Sky Lake on the server side of things for a while now. So AMD has arrived with Rome where they're expecting to see Ice Lake and they've got all these cores and they've got the opportunity to take a slice of the market and I'm sure they will take a slice of the market. The thing here again is AMD currently has a tiny share of the server market. Intel owns a very large part of the server market. So again, if AMD was to take five times the market share in servers, that would be massively significant, hugely significant, because once the companies start to shift over to AMD, I suspect they'll stick there for a year or two. Slow to move and then keen to remain once they're understanding what they're working with. The thing I'm particularly interested in seeing is pricing because uh, the impression given is that Epic is significantly cheaper than uh, Xeons that are even vaguely in the same ballpark. Question there is, uh, is, a, is Intel just going to give up that market share or are they going to respond? Um, presume they'll offer inducements of some sort, but will they actually just cut prices? That will be a radical step because some of the big Xeons, they're like ten and twelve thousand dollars a piece. I mean, I don't think there's such a thing as a cheap Xeon at the server level. But if Intel is forced to cut prices, that will be significant. But when I say the question of whether AMD or Intel is going to have a good or a bad year and it comes down to perspective, you can, for example, look at the fact that AMD owns the console market, absolutely owns it. What good does it do them? They turn over an awful lot of chips, that's for certain. People are familiar with AMD hardware. I, I don't know how many Xbox and PlayStation owners actually realize they're using uh, AMD hardware, but they are. The games developers are working with uh, AMD Radeon graphics, so that's useful, presumably, and it's turnover of cash. I've always had the impression from AMD's financials that the profit they get from those console chips is absolutely negligible. It's turnover with minimal margin, minimal profit. And that's something that Dr. Lisa Su, the boss of AMD, seems to be desperate to move away from. If they're going to sell it, they want to make a decent margin on it. They're not just going to give stuff away for the sake of it. And you have to admire that. Another hugely significant market, uh, which again, depending on your perspective, Mobile phones. Neither AMD nor Intel has any presence in mobile phones whatsoever. And we know Intel tried. Goodness me, did they try. There was actually a comment made about that at IDC um, when somebody said something like, now you're out of 5G, to which they said, no, 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 we're out of 5G in mobile phones. We're still heavily involved in 5G elsewhere, which I took to mean the servers running the back end of 5G as opposed to in-client devices. If they mean that we're going to see Intel hardware in laptops, you know, 5G modems there. I mean, I'd be very surprised that's true. So doubt that. Backbone, sure, server is a server, and Intel sells a lot of them. So there, for example, the competitor would be Qualcomm. Uh, I mean, I say competitor, the company that rules the world and using ARM designs, you know, Qualcomm, they are absolutely huge. So it depends on your perspective. So AMD rules consoles, Intel rules notebooks, and is likely to give up a slice of that to AMD and then wants to claim that back with Isolate just as fast as possible. I think AMD is going to take a hefty chunk of the enthusiast desktop market in the, in the rest of this year with uh, Zen 2 Ryzen 3000, and good luck to them. The thing there being is that the desktop market, as we know, has been dropping, dropping, dropping over the years. So if AMD can take a slice of a diminishing market and make some profits from it, good luck to them. The snag being is they need to make profits. The snag there is it means the processors won't be cheap. We know how much the 16 cores going to be, the 12 cores going to be. It would be nice if they were cheaper. So what AMD needs unfortunately rubs up against what I would like to see and that's a crying shame as the core count increases on the desktop. I have to hope that the uh, Ryzen 7 3000 models with 8 cores are very very good because those appear to be priced at a competitive point and then I have to hope that means we can ignore the 12 and the 16 cores. Uh, High-end desktop Intel 
kind of owns that because they kind of created it and you have to say that Threadripper came along and mucked that up for Intel royally and I would say that high-end desktop is in a very strange place at the moment. Intel is due to release Cascade Lake X still using the X299 platform still on 14 nanometer probably with a couple of pluses still up to 18 cores in other words tweaking it rather than innovating and then the question there is going to be again pricing are they going to cut the pricing down to that have to be close that's competing with Threadripper at 800 pounds 16 cores so the 18 call 999 well at the moment the 18 calls you know two thousand dollars so they're going to halve the price of HEDT parts can't see that they'd have to go somewhere between the two 1500 1200 if they did 1200 dollars that would be interesting and the obvious snag for Intel is that the uh, Ryzen 9 3000 part with 16 cores is due to go on sale for seven four nine dollars in uh, Q3 so they will be releasing an updated uh, Cascade Lake X part going up against a seven four nine dollar desktop part don't know that one's going to work out but I cannot see how that ends well for Intel it's fascinating to see direct competition but when you've got literally this AMD processor against that Intel processor rather than families of things it's really they intersect there and only there so that's of academic interest as a geek uh, but the bigger wider point is what happens in mobile with laptops for example I hope Zen 2 can do something there you might wonder why I started this by saying I was going to be positive about Intel here's the reason the money side of things if we look back to AMD's Q1 2019 figures their Q1 revenue was 1.27 billion dollars that was down from Q1 2018 now we know that AMD is both graphics and processors we know that the mining market did some funny things it's also true that in that Q1 2018 to Q1 2019 margins increased from 36% to 41% but in the chip market margins around 35 to 40% are terribly terribly low they have to invest a fortune in new chips those margins are not high enough consequence was profits in Q1 2018 had been 81 million with an M dollars and they fell to 16 million ie they just broke even net earnings per share one cent per share by contrast Intel Q1 2019 revenue 16.1 billion which was flat year on year margin was down it had been 60.6 percent it dropped to 56.6 percent in other words Intel's failure was still much better than AMD's success net income dropped from 4.5 billion a year ago to 4 billion in the quarter earnings per share 87 cents that's pretty much the important point there AMD earnings per share 1 cent Intel 87 percent so I've been to Fab 28 I've seen stuff moving around through a window that might have been absolutely anything they might have been cleaning the kit for all I know there may have been no wafers in sight I've seen people in bunny suits through those windows maintaining the tools and keeping an eye on what's going on I've actually been along with the other journals to the control room where they uh, run the show which was interesting wish to goodness I could have taken photos in there uh, essentially there's 60 people actually running the operation 24 7 that was really that was really good to see actually um, not that I understood a word of what was on the screens even though it was in English because they're literally monitoring each of the wafers going around the rounds and uh, checking that everything's absolutely happy uh, there was another place it took us to that I'm not even allowed to discuss which um, not quite sure I'm not allowed to discuss it but I'm not one thing I did find interesting was talking to the general manager of the fab I asked him at what stage does he know what the yield is from the fab does he know sort of at the end of the shift or when a particular wafer comes off the line or does he know at the week or the quarter he said he knows the current yield of every single wafer as it goes through every single stage of every single process essentially the impression I got was each time a little red X appears on one of those wafers I mean on the control system not the physical wafer in other words they've had a problem that he is aware of it because the obvious thing is they need to fix that problem they need to understand where it came from and fix it uh, but he literally tracks wafer by wafer every single fault as it happens in real time which was quite a surprising thing to learn and I can well believe it actually uh, I kind of thought that he got a report every so often 
very far from it. And that must surely mean that the problems at 10 nanometer have been heartrending for the people at Fab 28. We were told that 10 nanometer production had started at Fab 28 back in September 2018, so that's nine months ago. They didn't, however, say how many wafers were produced. My guess is they sent around a very few wafers in the first instance to see what the process looked like, and they realized the answer was it just didn't work. I mean, awful, catastrophic would be the kind of level of probably. And you would think they've then been sending around some 10 nanometer as they tweak and tweak and tweak, trying to get a fix uh, for the various problems. They've obviously had multiple problems. And as they've changed the process, because the 10 nanometer they're using now is definitely not the same 10 nanometer they started using um, a year, year and a half ago. That's just for sure. So as they've tweaked the process, they sent wafers around to see what the yields are like and all the reports are absolutely dreadful then they've been sending around presumably more wafers and they're now apparently producing 10 nanometer ice lake processors how many not a clue and this direct question was asked by two or three journals in a number of different ways and they, they're just not answering how many wafers go through the fab in total not saying how many are 10 nanometer how many are 40 nanometer not saying what we have been told is they are currently producing ice lake 10 nanometer parts at fab 28 which we will see sooner rather than later. And then the obvious follow on is what's going to happen at the rest of the market. The promise of the Ice Lake laptops at the moment is nothing particularly special. According to Intel's own information, it's going to be inferior to 40 nanometer plus plus. So the Sunny Cove design should bring you something. The process will lose you something. On balance, I don't know where we're going to stand. The only way I'm going to know is by seeing a 10 nanometer Ice Lake laptop, hopefully sooner rather than later. On the desktop side of things, we understand that the roadmap, which we have not been shown directly, this was leaked to Tweakers, I think it was in the Netherlands, uh, it seems the next desktop CPU is going to be Comet Lake, and we're still now 14 nanometer, and that appears to be plus plus, it might even be plus 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 by then, and that apparently is going to be 10 cores, so 10 cores on some LJ 11.5x socket. Goodness knows what the thermals will be, all the power, uh, presumably pro rata, it's going to go up. Maybe it's going to be 200 watts, you know, in the real world. That's an awful lot. How will that compete with Ryzen 3000? Don't know. I am very, very interested to see this. Don't make no mistake. However, I'm also painfully aware that the question of how the 10 core Comet Lake rumored processor competes with the 12 core and the 16 core Ryzen 3000, uh, Ryzen 9 3000 models. I'm interested to see this but it's very much a niche sport. That is absolutely so. The world is going to laptops and mobile phones. Intel and AMD have no presence in mobile phones to speak of whatsoever. Laptops at the moment, it's all Intel and AMD is desperate to get in there with Zen 2. So there are fights going on and coming up very soon that I'm very keen to see the results of. But as things stand, Intel is not dead dominates the laptop market and that is a very important market. Anyway, the next thing is going to be Zen 2 which is launching just over a week's time. Looking forward to that. If you like this video give it a thumbs up. I'm Leo Wood for Kit Guru. This is Leo Says. Hit the bell button. We'll alert you to new videos as they become available.